Our topic today out of the book of Esther, chapter 2, Esther's Providence. Chapter 2, verse 1, after these things, and the these things mentioned there is everything that happened in chapter 1. And so if you missed chapter 1, you can see that on shalomadventure.com. But in a quick summary, uh, the king had a uh, feast uh, for six months, and then he had another special one for seven days. And the seventh day of that seven days, when he was drunk, he asked for Queen Vashti to come before his throne and before his, all, his, every, all the men that were there with him. And she refuses, and he's told he should get rid of her, and he gets rid of her. And so after all those things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, in other words, when he sobered up from his hangover, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Now, it's interesting here how it's worded there, and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Not what he had commanded her rashly and foolishly to do, and thus she refused to do, or no, not what his advisors, what he agreed for his advisors to do to her. No, what she did and what they did. He puts the blame on others, right? He takes no responsibility for anything that happened. No responsibility that he was drunk and stupid. No responsibility that he listened to their advice and, and, and acted rashly before he sobered up. He blames it on them. He remembers what she did and what had been decreed against her. And he's thinking, now I don't have a queen. And no doubt, maybe the anger is starting to build up again. The red is starting to move up his neck again. And so his advisors quickly say, the king's servant said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Appoint officers in all the provinces that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women. Let beautiful preparations be given them, and then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Well, this thing pleased the king, and thus he did so. Okay, so they come up with this quick plan. Okay, we got rid of Vashti, but, you know, don't worry, king, it's going to be all right. We'll get you another one. Not only will we get you another one, you'll get to pick, and you'll get to pick among a whole bunch, however many you want. We'll just bring them all to you, and you just sit back, and you pick whatever you like. And Historians tell us that he was quite a womanizer. Some of the remains that they did find and excavate seem to indicate that there were buildings that very well could have been homes for the harem that he had. And we see that even when he had Vashti, he no doubt had other women because it mentions that there already was in place this women's quarters under whom Haggai, the king's eunuch, was the custodian of the women. And uh, you understand what Haggai the eunuch, you understand what it means to be a eunuch. I'm sure that wasn't by choice or by birth. He probably was taken, maybe captive, from one of the other lands that they had conquered. And, you know, oh, I want to be in the, the, the cabinet of the king. Well, not necessarily such a great position would end up as being yours. You might be assigned to be the custodian of the women, which means you have to become a eunuch so to make sure there's no hanky-panky going on in the king's quarters, so he assigned someone as custodian over the women who would have no desire for the women to keep everything safe. As far as his concubines, for him, his, con his concerns. And it might not be a bad idea for, uh, for some of our elected officials to have that done. That way we wouldn't have some of the problems we have in, in this country. It's amazing. There was this uh, person running for senator, I believe, and it just weeks before the election, it was shown that he had committed multiple affairs and he still got 48% of the vote, almost won, even after all of that. Unbelievable. There's another lady in Congress who uh, is a Muslim and, and yet she committed an affair with uh, her advertising agent after giving him hundreds of thousands of dollars to his agency, and then I think they got married after she had already married her brother. I don't know if that's under Islam law. I don't think so. But no one seems to care. 
Even those that are in her district, they re-voted her in also. Absolutely amazing. Not also, but they voted her in, at least the other guy didn't get in, but they voted her in again. Unbelievable. So anyway, the king didn't want any of that kind of stuff going on, and so back in that day, he made them eunuchs, which I'm sure Haggai was not excited about at all. Could you imagine being now in that position? He's now in this, he's got this job, and he probably can't leave the court much. Probably a 24-7 type position. That's his life. Never going to have a family. Never going to get married. Never going to have children. Horrible to live under those conditions. And so all these women being brought in before him, and they have to be under his... I can't imagine he's such a happy camper under those circumstances. I have to be forced into that job and have that done to him. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with uh, Yehoniah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. So a lot of details, and we've seen through this book of Esther, there's a lot of details, years mentioned, times, people, names, lots of names, the seven eunuchs, the seven princes, and now with this eunuch, and, and we'll see another one, and, and, and the lineage of Mordecai. So again, giving validity to the book, just a storybook once upon a time, it doesn't need so many details, but it's an actual, actual accurate occurrence of what took place. And it might have been written by Mordecai or someone who knew Mordecai, at least to know his genealogy, his lineage. And so it's listed there for us. Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, the, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So we learn a little bit about Mordecai here. Uh, he obviously kept track of his genealogy. That was important to him, his lineage, to know he was from the tribe of Benjamin. It was important for him to know his heritage, his Jewish heritage, and thus he maintained it. And we'll see later on how he maintains it. And so it's a bit about the character of Mordecai. And also that he was willing to take his cousin in. No doubt older than her. He treated her as a daughter. We don't know how much older he was. But then we don't know if he was married, and we don't know if his parents were still alive at this point, but uh, her parents died, and he takes her in and helps raise her. So again, the love and the mercy and, and the generosity that he showed towards her and the leadership that he gave towards her. Now, she was originally named Hadassah. That's her Hebrew name. And in Hebrew, Hadassah means myrtle, for the, the myrtle tree. And yet she becomes known as Esther. And the reason for that, Mordecai didn't want her to be, let her, we'll see that in a little bit, that for her to be known as Esther, to let her Jewishness be known for whatever reason. And, uh, and so Esther, he picks the name Esther, which is an interesting name because this is in the Medo-Persian kingdom and the media part of the kingdom, the language of the Medes, Esther means myrtle. So, similar to the Hebrew, so she still get, keeps the same name in that sense. And in Babylonian, which no doubt there was still a Babylonian influence, because that's the kingdom, one of the kingdoms that the Medo Persians took over. In Babylonian, Esther means Ishtar, the goddess of Ishtar, where we get the name Easter from for the Easter occasion. And Ishtar was a, a goddess, a pagan Babylonian goddess, and she was a goddess of fertility. And she was a goddess of love and a goddess of war, which could be appealing to a king, the king wanting to have a, uh, a queen who would give, her children, give him children and keep the lineage going, and who would be a goddess of war and help him in his wars. And so it could have been a, an appealing name, a wise name. And then in the, in the uh, language of the Persians, Esther means star. And so that would be an important name, a name that the, uh, the astrology and uh, astrologers, and the, so that the stars would, could have 
meaning for him? Does that be important? What are the stars saying? What are those lining up? What, are, what is my future? And so that would be appealing as well. And it would also be a, an important reminder every time he goes out for a walk at night and he looks up and he sees the stars, he'd be reminded of her. So very interesting name, very wise name for Mordecai to choose for her. And it says here also, so we're going to see where, we're wanting to see where God is in this book, even though God is not mentioned. And we also want to see how the book applies to us. And so here Esther will foreshadow the Messiah in this chapter in some ways, not in every way. Uh, no one foreshadowed the Messiah foreshadowed in every way. We have David foreshadowed the Messiah, but he wasn't a perfect example. Uh, Abraham foreshadowed the Messiah. He wasn't a perfect example. Moses foreshadowed the Messiah. He wasn't a perfect example. But in different ways, each one of them foreshadowed the Messiah. And so also Esther, in some ways, foreshadowed the Messiah. So here it says that she is, had neither father nor mother. And we read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, regarding Melchizedek, the king of Salem, Kohen of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then also king of Salom, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, similar to Esther, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a Kohen continually. So he's saying here that uh, Melchizedek foreshadowed the Messiah with neither beginning nor end, neither father nor mother, neither genealogy. And so Esther, in some ways, had neither father nor mother because they had died. And we don't know when she was born. Uh, we're told her father's name, um, but we're not told her mother's or that side, uh, the genealogy that way. And we're not told how long she lives. We're not told... When she dies, when the king gets assassinated, we don't know if that meant she had to get killed too, or if she was able to go back to Mordecai, or what exactly happened with her, we're not told. We're not told the ending of Esther. So again, in some ways like that. Back to Esther, chapter 2, verse 8. And so it was when the king's command, command and decree were heard, and many, and when many young women were gathered at Susan, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, custodian of the women. Right? So she made it. She got picked. She won the lottery, right? Or at least she got into the final drawing, right? Like you, you get one of those th flyers in the mail that said, you won $10,000. Oh, lucky you, right? Oh, look, I won $10,000. All you got to do is show up at our car dealership and scratch that off and see you really didn't win that. All you won was a comb or something, uh, you know, but they want to show you a car. Right? And so here she is. Oh, look, she won. Oh, I'm sure she was all excited about that. Every girl's dream to be uh, chosen to the ones that can possibly be picked to be queen. And so she's that much closer to being the queen, that much closer to the throne. Oh, I'm sure she was so excited. The life of luxury and riches and fame and oh this is going to be great right well i don't think so i doubt she was excited at all even though some of the movies may portray it that way and a lot of the esther movies are way off i doubt she was excited at all i doubt that that was her dream oh maybe everyone wants girl wants to be a princess but not necessarily a queen not necessarily a queen to a king who has this queen to come and dance before his nobles to show off her beauty maybe in a lustful way for these lustful men when they're drunk and if they disobey you're out i doubt that would be so exciting i bet esther had dreams of being a mom to be a wife having a household whether rich or poor or some way, shape, or form, the joy of a family. And then now it's not going to happen. She's taken in among with all these other women and brought into the king's court of women under Haggai, custodian of the women. So all these women are living together. No, no, how many are living per room? 
there they are, all together, all of them pretty disgruntled, no doubt, all of them maybe competing, or who's going to become the queen, and all of them, no doubt, missing their family. And we see that they weren't able to just go home on weekends. They weren't able to go home for Thanksgiving. So I doubt there was some unhappiness among all the women. And then they're with Haggai. And again, I can't believe he's such a happy guy in his lot in life. Oh, they, she might have a pool. She might have the indoor luxuries. She might have better meals than maybe she had at Mordecai's house. Maybe not. But I doubt it was a great situation. And maybe in your life you're under some situation that's not your ideal. Maybe something has happened in your life was not original, part of your original plan. Maybe because of a death, maybe a death of your parents or a death of your spouse or maybe some disability or something happened in your life. You had goals, you had plans, you had education, you had training. You were going to do this, become this, marry this, have these, and it didn't work out the way you had planned or maybe it hasn't worked out so far the way you had dreamed. Trust in the Lord. God has a plan. Verse 9, Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained, favor, obtained his favor, talking about Haggai, so the young woman, meaning Esther, Esther pleased Haggai, and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave her beautiful preparations for her, beside her allowance, then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the, women's, uh, in the house of the women. So something about her caught his attention, and she found favor with Haggai, and he moves her to the best room in this court of the women, and assigns her seven Maid servants over her. So again, the number seven. So she gets this privilege. No doubt the others didn't get seven. Maybe they got one. Maybe they didn't get any. But she gets seven. And in this best place. And beautiful preparations. Extra stuff for her. He's favoring her. She found favor with him. Now let me ask you a question. If she walked in there all depressed and downhearted and grumpy faced and I don't want to be here and I miss Mordecai and it's not right that my parents died when I was young and I had to be raised by my cousin and what am I doing here and how long is this going to take and what if I don't get chosen and why do I have to live with this roommate and was complaining left and right do you think she'd find favor with Haggai I don't think so Kind of like Joseph. Joseph found favor everywhere he went. Joseph was taken from his family and sold as a slave, and yet Potiphar found favor. Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes and made in charge of all that Potiphar had. And then when he's unjustly accused and thrown into prison, the jailer has favor, Joseph has favor in the jailer's eyes, and he's elevated to a top position there. And then when he's taken from there and he's Presented before Pharaoh, he finds favor in Pharaoh's eyes. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think if he was there at Potiphar's house as a slave and he was grumbling and complaining the whole time and bitter that he was taken away from his father and that his dirty dog brothers sold him into slavery and thought about killing him and rejected him and was grumbling and unhappy the whole time and I don't want to be here and I don't have to do your work and I don't want to have to be your slave? Do you think he would have found favor? When he was thrown in the prison, hey, this is unjust, this is unright, I shouldn't have. it was Potiphar's wife who did this to me, she lied, it wasn't my fault, and it was a bad, 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 and Potiphar shouldn't have listened to her, and besides that, let me tell you about my brothers, and go on and on and on with that. You think he'd find favor with the chief jailer? And if he still had that ugly face on him 20 years later, unhappy that he's in prison for a long time, and that the the uh, cupbearer forgot to tell the king about him for two years, tell the uh, uh, pharaoh about him for two years. And he was angry that whole time. You think if he showed up at pharaoh's court and unhappy and bitter for two years and bitter for all those years in prison and bitter for all those years of being in slavery, do you think 
the Pharaoh would have seen God's spirit within him? I don't think so. What type of face do you put on when you go to work? And not what you put on, what kind of face comes out? What is within us? Are we holding on to bitterness and rage and wrath because something happened to our parents, something happened to our spouse, something happened to our children, something happened to our job? We were taken out of the situation where we had dreams and plans and goals. It didn't go the way we had thought. Are we holding on to discontent? Surrender it to the Lord. Confess it as sin. Receive his forgiveness because of the sacrifice of the Messiah. And let him give you forgiveness to those who've wronged you. Let him give you faith to trust that God has a plan in spite of the wrongs and the disappointments that have taken place in your life. Let him give you hope and trust and courage and cheerfulness and rejoicing in your spirit and your mind and contentment in your life. That people will see God's spirit within you and that you may find favor in those that God puts you in contact with. Verse 10, and Esther had not revealed her people or her family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And so she's hidden, and actually that's another definition of the word, I forget if it's Hadassah, I think it's Hadassah, it means hidden. And so Esther is kind of hidden here. She's hide, hiding her identity. I don't necessarily know why Mordecai did that, but we'll see it works out well. Yeshua also had his identity hidden. His divinity was hidden under his humanity. He came into this world as the creator of this world, but he came here as a human, as a babe, and a poor babe, and the poorest of the babes, in a cow stable or sheep pen, and lived a life with poor people not as king, not as royalty, not as divinity. He was in hiding of who he was. And even though the angels told his parents, Mary and Joseph, they obviously didn't fully grasp it. Because then when he goes for his bar mitzvah between the age of 12 and 13, going on 13 to Jerusalem, he says to them, don't you know I should be about my father's business? Later on, even his brothers still don't understand and grasp exactly who he is. His disciples had a hard time understanding who he really was. For a long time, he basically was in hiding. And he doesn't enter into the ministry until he's in his close to 30. And so he lived a life of hiding who he was and his calling. And so Esther also is in hiding, hiding her identity and not revealing it. And again, we see Esther being obedient Submissive to Mordecai. Again, the type of attitude that we need to have of submission to those who are in authority above us and yet also being able to be in command and leadership to those that God has placed us in authority over. That balance of both. And so she does. And she's humble here and she's listening and obeying Mordecai. She did from her youth and she doesn't reveal who she is. Verse 11, every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. So again, once you go into the palace, once you're in the women's quarters, once you're in the king's realm, you don't know what's going on outside. She wasn't able to communicate with Mordecai easily because he got some messages or somehow Mordecai heard messages, maybe he bribed Haggai or someone who knew Haggai and he got messages of how she was doing. I didn't mean bribe, but I mean, you know, what paid him off to, to give me information about, uh, about my, he probably didn't reveal his cousin, about Esther. And so he finds out, as he can, he tries, goes there every day to listen in, see what he can hear, what he can find out, what news he can obtain. Again, showing the character of Mordecai, concerned, prayerful, interested, loving towards his cousin Esther diligent in that. And we also should be loving and caring and praying and interested in the lives and welfare of others that God has placed us in contact with. 
And so Esther's inside, not able to communicate necessarily so easily outside, and, and she's cloistered in there. And Verse 12, and eight young woman's turn came to go in to King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations of the women, for thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of mirth and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying the women. And so for at least a year from when they're taken to the king's palace, they don't get to go in before the king, they got to do this beautifying. Now, it said that they were supposed to pick young women, young virgins who were beautiful. And so, but they obviously weren't beautiful enough. <laughs> they still had to grease them up for a year. Get them ready. They had to put perfume on them or sort of six months. And then six months of perfuming them up to get rid of the smell of the ghetto or the common people and to transform this common person into a potential queen. And so 12 years, 12 months. And that means that from the first time, when the first one came in, she still had to wait a year, which means the king had to wait a year. But again, I have no doubt he had other women in the women's quarters, concubines, even when he had Vashti. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. So on her time comes, each one comes in their line, in their time, and they come and it's their turn and they get to go before the treasure chest and pick out whatever they want to wear before the king and to take with them because when they leave Haggai's Court of the Women, we'll see they don't come back there. They end up going to another place, again with probably the concubines back from Vashti's day. And so they get to take with them whatever they want. And if they knew, you knew that this was it, this was, I can have anything here I want, and this is what I'm going to take with me, this is what I'm going to have to live off of. And I imagine they may be stocked up, right? There's bracelets up and down their arms, necklaces weighing them down. This is their riches, their riches. this is their dowry, this is what they're going to have. If they're not going to make it as queen, well, they're going to take with them what they can. And uh, maybe I'll try and send this to mom, and I'll try and send this to my sister, and, and uh, spread the wealth a little bit. And so they took what they were able to take, whatever they wanted, from the king's palace with them. In the evening she went in, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Shashages, the king's eunuch, who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called her by name. So again, they go from the one woman's quarters through the king, and if she's not chosen, she ends up with the other women. And again, I can't imagine that's such a great life. There you are with all these women, and they're not so happy either, I guess, and they're not able to communicate much with their family, if at all. Right? We saw that Mordecai had to hang out at the gate to try and find the news, and later on we see even when, when Posters are posted on every single lamppost in town. The people inside the courts don't have any ideas what's going on. They have no idea what's going on outside there. And so they're kind of cloistered in there. And then you're stuck with all these other women with another eunuch over you, who, again, probably not so excited about his job. And again, I don't know how close and how tight the quarters were, but not really a family setting, not a family setting at all. And now you're a concubine for life. And any time the king wants you, he remembers your name, if he happens to remember your name, and that's where, again, Esther, probably a good name to be remembered so that she could come to mind to the king. If you had a name like uh, Shashagiz or something like that, <laughs> you'd never be remembered. And I would be surprised if the king just let them lay around and be beautiful concubines all that time. I'd imagine he gave them something to do. Maybe they were the ones who helped prepare the meals for when he had all these big feasts that he had. Maybe they washed windows or dusted or vacuumed or did something around the court. Maybe he kept them busy doing something. And so basically they're as slaves and as sex slaves for the king whenever he desires. And who knows if he ever sold them out to his people within his realm and princes and he has some one of his Governors of one of the princes of one of the provinces come in. 
give one of his concubines for the night. And if she does end up with a child, well, that's not really a great setting to raise a child under. In a house with all just these women, no fatherly figure. This eunuch there is over everybody. Again, who knows how many per household or room or setting. Not what I think most people would desire. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abahel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, to go in to the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Second time, she finds favor, not only with Haggai, but all who saw her. And why? Well, we see here in this verse a, a little bit more about character. She was submissive to Mordecai. And here she is, and no doubt again, chose to be cheerful, chose to be thankful, chose to rejoice in the Lord always under horrible circumstances like Paul in prison, choosing to rejoice in the Lord always. She chose to rejoice, and rejoicing is different than happiness. She chose to be thankful in spite of it, chose to trust God, chose to rejoice anyway. And she's submissive even to Haggai. She gets to go and look through the chest, take out whatever she wants, and instead of just grabbing what she likes, she says to Haggai, well, what do you think? You know the king, you've been around him a lot. What color is his favorite color? How much jewelry should I put on, or how little? How much is too gaudy to, for his taste? How much is just right? What perfumes does he like? What smells does he like? She's interested in what would be best for him, and what does Haggai, I think, will be best for her. Others concerned, submissive, humble, obedient, trusting, Trusting in God, trusting in those that God has placed in a position to give her advice, willing to seek advice, willing to listen to advice, willing to listen to others. These are the characteristics of Esther and can be ours as well because we can have the same spirit that God placed upon her, the same spirit that God placed upon Joseph in trying circumstances, the same spirit he placed upon Paul he can place upon us as well, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our situation, regardless of our difficulties, regardless if we're in a place that we don't want to be right now. And thus we can find favor with others. So Esther was taken to the king Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign. So again, lots of details, the exact month and year. So it's the seventh year of his reign, and again, the number seven again. It's the seventh year of his reign. How many years has he been without a queen? Okay, a little trivia question there for you. How many years? If you were listening last week, you would know that. And you all forget? I know most of you were here last week. It was the third year when he had his party and Vashti was removed. Thus has been, give or take, four years without a queen. That's a long time to not have a queen on your throne. That's a long time, but he had a lot of women come through during that time. So he was busy. He still didn't have a queen. Now in that time period, how many women maybe came through? Right, if he was seeing one woman a week, That'd be 150 women. No, more than that. Four years, that'd be 200 women. Or even if it was once a month. That'd be over 50 women. Close to 50 women. That's a lot of women to go through in that time period. To end up as concubines. And then Esther has to come along after all of that. Obviously, he's very picky. He's building up his concubine line, plus those that are already there before this. So he's got quite a harem. 
What was it about Esther? Why did he choose Esther? The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set a royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. She also finds favor with the king. Found favor with all who saw her, found favor with Haggai. Something about her. And I doubt the king was just looking for another sex mate. I doubt it was sex that is why he chose her. You know, for the king, all he needed was sort of show up for him to have great sex. And he already had all these other concubines, so it wasn't for sex that he was looking for. He was looking for someone of nobility. Someone who would represent the kingdom. Someone who could sit with him, not again as a husband-wife, that he's not interested in, but someone who can sit with him as king and queen. Someone who walks uprightly, someone who walks securely. Someone who is strong in character. Someone who will be obedient to him as king, but also able to reign as queen on the queen's side of the kingdom. He's that balance of both. Someone who he can see inside her that he has the, she has the ca character of justice and judgment, but also of submission and humility. And we've already seen that Esther has the submission part. She submitted to Mordecai. She submitted to Haggai. She submitted to God's will and chose to be thankful, chose to be happy with her lot in spite of it, chose to be thankful, and no doubt that beamed out of her and was seen in her. She was not greedy, not selfish, not concerned for herself and her own well-being and what she could amass for herself. To beautify herself, not looking in the mirror, Haggai, what do you think I should look like? How do you think I should dress? How modest, how, in, not, how much should I show, how little should I show? Submitted. And yet we see later on, she also has the bearing of strength as well. Not a rebellion strength, but a leadership strength. And God can give each of us that balance in our lives because sometimes we're to be followers, sometimes we're to be leaders, and every good leader has to be a good follower. And maybe not leading the world, God's not called you to be president or something like that, but in some circumstance, in some situation, maybe just for a day, maybe as a substitute in a class. Maybe to take command that some situation that happens in the street, an accident takes place, and someone needs to be there and take command of the situation to help those that are injured or to speak to the police. And whatever the case, we need to be able to have the balance of both. Tell the truth. Stand for the right. To be leaders and commanders even of ourselves. To have self-control by God's spirit, by God's power. Esther had the balance of both. And God can give us the balance of both. As we submit to him. As we fear him. As we surrender to him on a daily basis. He'll give us that spirit of humility to be submissive when we need to be submissive. And he'll give us the courage and the strength to be strong when we need to be strong. As we seek him out, as we come to him and find favor with him. Again, as Yeshua found favor with God and with man, God can give us that favor as well. And so she's exalted, she becomes the queen. She is not necessarily so great. Uh, she's not able to come to the king anytime she wants. She's not there as a husband-wife team. Better than a concubine, no doubt. And so praise God in his providence, he has elevated her to this position. And the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. This king likes to party. He partied in chapter 1, he's partying here, has a party in chapter 2. We're going to see there's like seven or so parties throughout, uh, either given for him or by him. Through this uh, book, uh, he likes to party and live it up. And so he's rejoicing for Queen Esther. Here she is, raised up to this pinnacle position. And God will raise us, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, 
and he will raise you up. He's got a position for you, a place for you. It might not be what you dreamed of. It might not be ideal. It might not be fame and, fat and, and fortune, but he's got just assuredly, as he has a place reserved for you in heaven, he has a place reserved for you here on earth every single day and within every day to be about his business and about his calling upon your life. Surrender each morning to him. Let him lead and let him guide and direct in your life. And so, in a moment as we pray, when we pray, whatever area applies to your life today, maybe you're in a position, again, a situation that's not ideal, not what you dreamed, not what you thought, not what you wanted, not your will, but you're there. Maybe it's not the job you had originally dreamed of. The marriage might not have worked out as you originally thought. Maybe the kids aren't what you originally planned. Or maybe you didn't get kids. Maybe you didn't get a spouse. Maybe you didn't get that job. Maybe your parents aren't what you think they should be. Maybe your neighbors in your neighborhood, or your house, the car that you just got, whatever. But it is what it is. And we can choose to be content. If you need to choose to be content, and maybe make some changes, maybe sell that house, maybe repair that car, maybe work on loving your spouse more, and maybe love will return more. Maybe seek out a different job. Maybe make the best of the job it is. But at the moment right now, choose to be content while you seek to make things better. Choose to surrender to God if this is his will, if this is his plan, if this is his lot, and see what he has in store for you. And so that applies to you in a moment when we pray, ask God to give you that gift of contentment. Secondly, if when you look in the mirror there's a scowl, or maybe you don't see it, but maybe other people see it, maybe you're still angry at someone else, maybe you're angry still about the situation in your life, maybe you're angry that your parents died or some unfortunate thing happened in your life, or you didn't get what you thought, or you got injured or disabled, or something is not what you had wanted, and you're angry and it's showing up on your face, and you're not finding favor with others. In a moment when we pray, you can surrender that aspect to the Lord, ask him to give you, your, give you his spirit, that his countenance shines forth, that his joy shines forth, in spite of the troubles, in spite of the disappointments, and that you're able to find favor with God and with men as Yeshua did and grow up under his leadership and grow in him. Thirdly, if God has placed you in a position of trust to humbly seek out advice of others, the king sought advice of his advisors, the queen sought out advice. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety and maybe you're in a situation we should be seeking out advice before you move forward. And ask God to give you the humility, ask God to give you the wisdom to know who to ask the advice of. They shouldn't ask advice of everybody necessarily, but to seek out advice from those that God has granted wisdom and knowledge and skill to. And so if that applies to you, let God do his work in your life. And as God is still unfolding his plans that he has for you, let us surrender our daily lives to him. Let him work in his, our lives. Let him lead and guide and direct. Let him fulfill his will in our lives. And of course, as always, if this week, if there's some sin in your life, some rebellion in your life, surrender it to the Lord. Receive his forgiveness. Receive his mercy. Receive the Messiah's sacrifice in your behalf and let him cleanse you that there be nothing on your record book. You can be without spot and wrinkle before him. Let him fill you with his Holy Spirit. Let him walk you in newness of life. If any of those areas apply to you or maybe something else, let us pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, we praise your name, and we thank you, Lord, for raising up Esther. Thank you for having Vashti brought down so that she could come up. And Lord, if we need to come down in some area of our lives so that 
someone else can come up, give us the humility. Or if you're calling us to be placed in a position, then make us faithful to that position. Give us humility, give us balance, give us security, give us strength, give us courage. Walk inside us, secure, with our heads high, looking towards you, trusting in you. Give us faith. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.